Uh, so I've been asked to talk about the present of AI and the, uh, the future of AI, but not to talk too much about the end of the world. So as you all know, things are very exciting these days. The United Kingdom uh, has announced a billion pound or about $1.3 billion push into AI. Not to be outdone, the French have gone a little bit higher with uh, $1.8 billion. And the EU is talking about an 18 billion pound uh, investment over the next few years. And of course, China, as you know, has announced $150 billion. So things are very, very exciting. In, uh, in academia, things are going completely bonkers. Uh, the number of submissions to the major conferences, uh, AAAI uh, and NeurIPS, uh, have grown, of course, exponentially like everything else, but really exponentially over the last few years. Uh, NeurIPS sold out in less than 10 minutes uh, for the latest edition, uh, and that's more than 8,000 attendees in 10 minutes. Um, so things are going completely insane. What I'm going to talk about is the standard model of AI, and this is the model under which everything uh, to date has been developed. Uh, in the standard model of AI, a machine is intelligent if its actions can be expected to achieve its objectives. And I call this a standard model because it's actually a model that's common to many different technologies of the 20th century. Uh, in control theory, we minimize a cost function. In operations research, we maximize a reward function. In statistics, we minimize a loss function. In economics, we ma maximize a welfare function or a utility function. So in all these disciplines, humans supply the objectives, and AI is the optimizing machinery which then carries out the solution for those objectives. And this sounds great. What I'll tell you tomorrow is actually that this standard model is completely wrong, uh, and we need a completely new model where machines are useful if they achieve the objectives that humans have, not the objectives that machines have. The history of AI has been talked about many times in many different ways. I actually want to start a little early uh, in 340 BC, when Aristotle actually wrote uh, quite a bit about the problems of uh, automation leading to loss of employment. Uh, and he quite clearly stated that if we had uh, fully autonomous intelligent systems, for example, uh, musical instruments that could play themselves or, or weaving devices that could weave their own cloth, uh, then we, we, we would have no need for human workers. Uh, and that point remains true today. Uh, the field really got started uh, with the first uh, universal Turing machine in 1842 uh, with Babbage and Lovelace, uh, and they explicitly pointed out that this universal machine could be used to do anything to which the human mind could be applied. Uh, and of course, a few years later, uh, in a magazine called The Primitive Expounder, which is a sort of uh, religious tub-thumping magazine, uh, Richard Thornton said that such machines would, of course, take over the world. Uh, now, fortunately, uh, or perhaps unfortunately, Babbage never built his machine, uh, and we had to wait for the Second World War until we had real computers. And then Alan Turing, of course, wrote his seminal paper talking about how AI was going to go, uh, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And what most people may not know is that uh, before and after that paper, he'd also talked about the fact that um, when AI succeeded, when machines became more intelligent than human beings, we would have to expect to lose control. He was completely unapologetic and matter-of-fact about this prediction. The field began officially in 1956 with the Dartmouth workshop, uh, with McCarthy and Claude, uh, Claude Shannon. And then for the next 50 or 60 years, we saw waves of optimism followed by crashing disappointment when the technology just turned out not to be up to the task uh, that it was promised to do. Since 2010, we've had a wave of optimism. And we have yet to see whether there's going to be a crashing disappointment or not. Uh, I am somewhat optimistic that we will avoid that fate this time. So the areas of AI 
include everything that we need in order to make an intelligent system function successfully in the real world. The oldest area is probably uh, the area of combinatorial search, problem solving, game playing, uh, and we use that today uh, in all of your map applications, your GPS navigation, uh, in robot motion planning, in protein design, uh, and of course the victories over the human Go World Champion, uh, and more recently the StarCraft Champions. Uh, sometime in the 1960s, uh, we developed the technology for logical reasoning, uh, which is general in the sense that a logical reasoning system can answer, oof, uh, can answer any, uh, can answer any question uh, that you can write down with respect to any knowledge that you can provide. And logical technology underlies software verification, hardware verification. Um, we do mathematics with it. Uh, we build construction plans with it. Uh, we run many of our websites. Uh, we've almost forgotten uh, that many of our websites are run by logical rule-based systems. Uh, the technology of good old-fashioned AI is in use every day by almost everybody on Earth. We also, in the 1980s, began to think much more about uncertainty. Parabolistic reasoning became popular mainly through the work of Uta Pearl. Uh, with Bayesian networks, uh, and this technology is used in tens of thousands of applications for modeling, reasoning, diagnosis, uh, monitoring systems. The Mars rover is using parabolistic monitoring systems to keep track of what's going on with its own health. Uh, we use it for medicine, uh, and as I'll point out uh, in a few minutes, uh, for uh, monitoring the Earth for nuclear explosions. The technology that's most exciting today uh, is the technology of supervised machine learning, particularly deep learning, uh, where um, we have large uh, sets of training data, um, and with that training data, we can optimize enormous tunable circuits called deep networks, uh, which we then use to make predictions. And we've seen this uh, achieve human-level capabilities in visual object recognition, in speech recognition, machine translation. Three of the holy grails of AI that people have worked on uh, since the 1950s, um, and those holy grails are now in our hands. So it's not surprising that there's a great deal of excitement happening right now. And then finally, reinforcement learning, where systems learn not from training data that's labeled by humans, but from a simple reward signal, a Go program that learns simply from being told when it's won and when it's lost the game. Um, and then AlphaGo played itself many times uh, and became superior in its understanding of the game to any human. We're also seeing the use of reinforcement learning for driving, for uh, robotic manipulation. Trading agents uh, on the stock markets use it to learn how to trade better. Uh, and just for fun, um, the malfeasance sector, which is probably the most innovative sector in the world economy, um, has been using AI reinforcement learning for automated blackmail uh, because blackmail has a perfect reward signal, which is how much money do you extract from the victim, uh, and then you can learn to do your automated blackmail much more effectively. Uh, so the excitement uh, with deep learning, I think, really began with the ImageNet competition. So I just wanted to illustrate this idea of supervised learning. Uh, in ImageNet, there are millions of label photographs. So each photograph is is just collected from the web. Uh, typically, it has a single obvious subject. Uh, what is the thing in the photograph? And then uh, we have human beings label these millions of photographs into thousands of different categories of object. And then that data is used to train machine learning algorithms to predict images that they have never seen before. So they learn to recognize objects in photographs. And the competition uh, measures the error rate um, so here on the, the uh, vertical axis, we see the error rate going from about 30% in 2010 down to about 5% in 2015. And uh, just for comparison, I've shown the human error rate on the same data set. So this is a human being who has spent several weeks learning to recognize the objects according to the categories defined by the competition. So in 2015, we actually exceeded the human error rate um, and by 2017, the error rate was down to 2%, so substantially better than a trained human being at recognizing objects and photographs. So this is clearly uh, a major breakthrough for AI, and it's one of the things that's responsible 
for the, uh, the massive level of investment and excitement that we see today. Another big event was the victory of AlphaGo over Lee Sedol, um, particularly in Asia where Go is seen as the pinnacle of human intellectual activity, to see a machine defeating humans and playing moves that humans simply didn't understand at all. Only after the fact did they realize that the moves AlphaGo was playing were really teaching humans how to play Go in ways that we'd simply never understood before. So this was, if you like, China's Sputnik moment, uh, and that caused the Chinese government to announce its enormous investment plans for AI. I actually think that uh, a more recent event, uh, the success of Alpha Star, which plays the StarCraft game, to be much more significant, because the StarCraft game is much closer to the real world, in the sense that whereas Go has typically about one to 200 possible move choices, StarCraft has 10 to, 10 to the power of 100 or 10 to the power of 200 move choices. A game of Go lasts about 200 moves. A game of StarCraft might last 20,000 moves. So it's much closer to decision making that we see in the real world. And the victory over human experts, I think, is much more significant. So here's another example. Um, this is from OpenAI, and uh, it might not seem that impressive. Um, they are ro they're si simulated robots, and the blue uh, one is, has learned to uh, score against the goalkeeper. So if you're uh, an England fan, you're probably not used to this level of success in penalty, <laughs> in penalty taking. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, and you know, they don't have feet, so that's why they have this somewhat strange gait where they have to uh, bet, put their knees in and wa waddle around. Um, because it's very slippery. But uh, he gets pretty good. Now, what's interesting about this is that these robots had absolutely no physical capabilities when they were born. They were newborn babies. All they could do was sort of lie on the ground and jiggle. And in the space of a few hours, they learned to stand up. They learned to move around purposefully. They learned to kick the ball. They learned to save the goals. And um, if your baby was born, and two or three hours later was standing up in the garden scoring goals against their mom or dad in the goal, uh, you'd be completely terrified. <laughs> now, this was a, so this was a very impressive achievement. But uh, my student, Adam Gleave, who's, uh, who's now actually doing an internship at DeepMind around the corner, um, was actually suspicious. He wasn't sure if it had really learned to take penalties uh, in a purposeful way. So he said, OK, can we, can we train the red goalie to do something that will cause the blue uh, kicker to actually fail in this? And so um, here's what he did. Um, and as you notice, the, the red goalie basically falls down and waggles his leg in the air like this. And, um, and this causes the blue player to completely fail in his task. So now, now this, for the England fans, this is more like it, right? It's, <laughs> Uh, you see, and I don't know, I, I haven't tried, we could try with the left leg and see if that actually helps, but, but certainly the right leg waggling seems, seems to work really well. Um, and I don't know if the blue player is just laughing too hard or, or, or what, but he really has a difficult time uh, kicking the ball at all. And so, um, so this just goes to show that in fact, uh, even though we have enormous numerically measurable success in these, uh, uh, with these learning algorithms, it may not be quite what you think is going on. Uh, that we still have a long way to go to understand how to do learning in a robust way. Uh, and it's quite clear when you see this that in fact the blue player is not really trying to score a goal. He doesn't really know what the ball is or what kicking is. Um, and uh, there's actually a long, long way to go before we have anything that resembles the human capability for learning and understanding. So I would like to express a note of caution for those of you who are investors, for those of you who are thinking about careers for your children, whatever it might be, um, don't believe everything that you read, uh, don't take everything at face value, do your due diligence, get underneath and see what's really going on. Um, so when you see that data is the new oil, just remember data is the new snake oil. Uh, and in particular, this is true because machine learning is getting better and better. What does that mean? That means that you need less and less data. Humans learn visual, visual categories from one or two examples, not from one or two billion examples. 
And so uh, the better the machine learning, the less data you need. So um, data may not be the new, oil, the new oil in the way we think. I think there's also a chance that uh, we might see major failures, particularly in the self-driving car area. Uh, the technology is already about five or even 10 years later than people were projecting and confidently stating in the media uh, where they'd be selling self-driving cars to the general public. This isn't really happening yet, um, and we are still seeing deaths occurring on a fairly regular basis as a result of poor quality technology. So if the car companies lose patience uh, and start pulling back on their investments, uh, then you might see a stampede for the exit. Um, but I'm actually reasonably confident, uh, particularly uh, with the, the leading companies, the quality of the work they're doing is excellent, um, and I believe they will overcome the problems uh, that they currently face. Now, the shortcomings of deep learning are not uh, a mystery to the leaders in the field. Uh, Google has been talking about the need to go far beyond that. Uh, Demis Hassabis at uh, DeepMind uh, has talked about the need uh, to actually go back uh, and pick up on all the tasks that AI was working on in the good old-fashioned AI period in the 1980s. Uh, logic, reasoning, knowledge, uh, these are things that are unavailable to current deep learning technology. I actually want to talk about a, uh, another area of AI, um, which is currently very popular, called parabolistic programming. And what this means is essentially combining Probability theory, which has been around for centuries as the mathematical theory of uncertain knowledge, reasoning, and learning, uh, with the kinds of formal languages that AI and other branches of mathematics have produced. In particular, first-order logic or predicate calculus, uh, which underlies things like logic programming, um, or with just general-purpose programming languages. So the, co the combination of probability theory with these things gives you what we call a universal probabilistic modeling language. So universal in the same sense as a Turing machine is universal. That means that any mathematical probabilistic model that can be written in any language can be written concisely in one of these languages. And any query against any model and any evidence can be answered by general purpose inference algorithms. So clearly, if this can be made feasible and efficient, uh, this is an enormous step forward for the field. And um, just as we saw with NIPS and AAAI attendants, the number of, of probabilistic programming papers is also going bonkers. Let me illustrate one, one uh, application of probabilistic programming, which is the Global Seismic Monitoring System for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So the treaty bans uh, nuclear tests anywhere on Earth, and it has a verification regime uh, which requires detecting any explosion anywhere on Earth with high probability. So the evidence that's collected is um, uh, collected from a huge network of stations all around the world, the International Monitoring System, um, and that is seismic data. So it looks like wiggles from these very, very sensitive seismic detectors. That's all collected in Vienna. And then the query that's answered is, what happened today? What were all of the seismic events that occurred anywhere on Earth? How big were they? How deep were they? Uh, and are they suspicious? Uh, this is called the bulletin, um, and uh, it's produced every single day. In order to answer this question, we combine the evidence with the model. The probability model describes what we know about the geophysics of event occurrence, of signal transmission, of detection, uh, the noise levels, uh, the background noise levels of the Earth, and so on. So here is the software for the global monitoring system for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. There it is. Okay, I'm not going to go through it line by line, uh, but just to point out that it fits on one slide, right? This is the probabilistic programming model uh, that we use uh, on a daily basis for monitoring the treaty. Um, and just to illustrate one of the cases where it was uh, very helpful to have it running, uh, this is the 2013 test from North Korea. Um, so off goes uh, the nuclear bomb, uh, and then a few minutes later, uh, thousands of kilometers away, we start to see minute vibrations in the Earth, and all that information is collected um, and sorted out because, of course, during that period, there are dozens of other seismic events occurring in other places on the Earth. 
um, and then the system produces its estimate of where the event took place and so on. So this is the location from the world's leading seismologists. They got together after the event, put, to, put together all the data, and estimated this was the location. This is the location that our system produced in real time uh, based on the data that was collected. And then later on, from satellite imagery, this was uh, discovered to be where the tunnel entrance was for the North Korean testing facility. So we were much closer, and we did it in real time and fully, uh, fully automatically. So ever since uh, the beginning of January l last year, uh, this large-scale parabolistic model uh, has been running as the monitoring system for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So what's coming next? Uh, lots of amazing things are coming, uh, just looking at what's already in the research pipeline and then projecting forward in time. Robots are making their way out into the real world. They will be on the roads, they'll be in warehouses, uh, eventually they'll be in our homes doing useful stuff for the elderly and so on. We're all going to have, uh, instead of stupid personal assistants, uh, Alexas and Siris, we're going to gradually, or they, those systems are gradually going to become much more intelligent and much more useful to help us in all aspects of our life. Uh, our health, our daily uh, calendars, our financial lives, uh, our educational lives, and so on. We're going to see systems on a global scale, for example, reading all information that humanity has accumulated since the beginning of time. Uh, machines will be able to read, understand, integrate that information, and answer questions with respect to it. We're also able now, because of satellites, to actually see the entire Earth every day, to record all of the visible objects, which uh, go down to things the size of cows and perhaps even people, uh, to record their positions and their activities, uh, and then to provide that in database form uh, for applications, including many of the SDGs. So just think about this, right? A machine that reads everything the human race has ever written and can see the entire Earth at once. These are superpowers that are simply unavailable to the human race until now. So what about human-level AI? Well, I'm not here to tell you that human-level AI is just around the corner. I really don't think it's just around the corner. There are major unsolved problems that we need to solve in order to reach human-level AI. Uh, those include the capability for real understanding of language, the ability to learn uh, not just from data, but also to learn with knowledge. When a physicist interprets their experimental data, they're not doing it as a blank slate. They're doing it as physicists who already understand physics and bring that knowledge to bear to understand the data. Uh, and that's a completely different way of doing learning uh, than we are currently capable of. Uh, hu humans also manage to do things on timescales that are simply unreachable. AlphaGo looks ahead 50 or 60 steps in the, into the future. You, in deciding to come here, uh, looked ahead about uh, 150 million steps into the future. That's how many physical actions you do to come to a conference. And yet you were able to think, because you have access to many, many levels of abstraction, and you can seamlessly integrate those levels of abstraction in your planning and your acting, uh, you're able to operate on timescales that are unreachable for current AI algorithms. So these are some of the breakthroughs we still need, and it's very hard to predict when they're going to occur. Just to give you uh, an example of how hard it is to predict, here is um, uh, a speech from Lord Rutherford, the most famous physicist of the early 20th century uh, in the area of nuclear physics, talking about uh, the possibility of nuclear powers. Well, he was, given, uh, he was giving a talk at the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Leicester. Uh, somebody asked him, well, you know, do you think in 25 or 30 years we'll ever be able to get energy from atoms? Uh, and he said, no, this whole idea is moonshine. Uh, it's impossible. And uh, Leo Zillard, who was staying at the Imperial Hotel, which is just down at Russell Square, uh, read this in the Times the next morning and invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. So it went from completely impossible to essentially solved in about 16 hours. So I'm not saying that we could have human-level AI in 16 hours, because there are multiple breakthroughs that have to happen, not just one. But I think we have to operate on the assumption that we are going to have human-level AI, um, and it's quite likely to occur 
within, shall we say, the foreseeable future, within the lifetime of my children, for example. Now, this could be an incredible thing. The upside is really uh, unlimited. It gives us uh, a step change in civilization because civilization is the result of intelligence. If you have a lot more of it, you can have a much better civilization. A simple calculation shows that if we just use AI to allow people to have a normal standard of living, what we in the West would call a normal standard of living, that's a tenfold increase in the GDP of the world. Uh, and the net present value of that is $13,500 trillion. So think back to the slide where I talked about the UK investing a billion pounds, one billion pounds, right? Well, that's essentially zero. Uh, the UK is investing zero compared to the size of the prize, okay? Uh, and so uh, the momentum is enormous uh, and the levels of investment will increase. The downside includes uh, the complete subversion of Western democracy, uh, the uh, use of AI systems to, uh, to kill humans on a massive scale, um, the elimination of employment for most of the human race, uh, and, uh, and possibly uh, misuse by uh, bad actors uh, to cause mayhem uh, throughout the world. And even if we solve that one, then there's also the problem of overuse of AI, not misuse, but overuse, uh, which results in the enfeeblement of the human race. So these are all things that we must think about, not only on a technological, but a cultural, political level. Um, and then there's the possibility that we might actually lose control. As Turing himself predicted, uh, humans would lose control over our own futures. So I'll tell you how to avoid some of those problems tomorrow. Uh, let me just summarize by saying that, uh, as we are aware, there's rapid progress in many areas of AI. Um, I think that deep learning is going to end up merging with other branches of AI, including probabilistic programming, uh, in order to provide the next wave of innovations in the field. There are going to be applications both on an individual and a global scale of enormous value to humanity. The question of whether human-level AI uh, is going to arrive, I think, is, uh, is one that we can't answer. We might manage to kill ourselves before it happens. So let's hope that doesn't happen. But we have to operate on the assumption that it's going to arrive, because if it arrived tomorrow, we would not be prepared. We would not know how to control it, uh, and we might well lose control over the world. So there is enormous upside uh, and potentially enormous downside. So what I'm, uh, my, my takeaway here is please think hard about solutions for the problems that I talked about. We won't reap the benefits of AI if we don't avoid the risks of AI. So we need to think about control, we need to think about governance, and we need to think about the fair use of AI for humanity. Thank you very much.